when the dynamic changed, then the push for returns through venture capital funds, but also on the private equity side, that pressure has become more and more apparent as 2023 has progressed. And this is this trend is only going to continue into 2024. And even some people that I know are saying into 2025 as well. Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be your host for the VC the next podcast. And today we have Stephen Marks with us. Stephen is the managing partner at Immersion Capital. Immersion Capital invests in lower middle market businesses and complementary early stage companies with international growth prospects in the US and Latin American region. Stephen has advised family offices, private equity, asset managers and middle market companies on both domestic United States and cross-border opportunities in Latin America in a consulting and fractional capacity. In this episode, we talk about how LPs have changed their approach while deploying in VC funds, the need for VCs to start showing returns to LPs, the impact on how startups are operating, the chain reaction in the VC ecosystem, the Latin American startup ecosystem, the outsourcing potential of Latin America, the buy and sell side activity happening in the markets right now, the uptick in secondary transactions and so much more. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. Hey, Stephen, so good to have you on the VC 10X podcast. How are you doing? Prashant, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. I enjoy the podcast. Thanks so much, Stephen. It's so good to have you here on the podcast. Uh, to start things off, can we first have your story and what's been your journey and involvement with VCs and LPs? So the, the way to think about me is that I wear a few different hats. The first is that I'm an advisor to both LPs, VCs, private equity funds, and then also companies themselves, whether it's a startup, typically later stage, um, also middle market companies as well. Uh, my journey is actually a little different uh, than I'd say most advisors in that I have always been very entrepreneurial and and from the time I was even uh, a kid when I was in high school and, and into into university uh, when I had started my, my first two companies and my my transition though into the investment world came because I started working for multifamily offices and, and I had to develop a, a hard skill set in the investment world in order to then create a niche, which is which is really what I've done, is that I help fill in a gap for these different groups and then utilize my skill set to help them with transactions. Um, could be making an investment, acquiring a company, scaling a company, and and along the way have have sort of pivoted a, a few times and, and developed other skills that that have helped me um, in an advisory role. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. Uh, so you kind of have this bird's eye view of what's happening in the LP ecosystems because you're working with them, you and also the VC ecosystems because uh, those are also some of uh, the people you work with. So would love an insight into. Uh, especially in the current market, when we see that the funding ecosystem has slowed down a bit, the deployments have slowed down. A bit. Uh, so how has that impacted the LP deployments to the VC asset class uh, versus the other asset classes? Uh, are they reducing that asset class, uh, the VC asset class, uh, or are they slowing it down? Or what's, what's the approach they're taking there? If you look at things from the perspective of a limited partner now, everything is upside down from where it was a few years ago. And, and part of that started when the when free money uh, changed. And, and my reference to that is the fact that in particular in the United States, the, the federal bank has uh, changed their approach to interest rates, which has actually impacted especially ultra high net worth. Um, individuals and families and their investment approach. Uh, less so on the institutional side, but but more so when you start talking about family offices. And the those high net worth families or, or individuals are allocating less into riskier um, investment classes. And that's what's happening with VC. It's it, when when the dynamic changed then the push for returns 
through venture capital funds, but also on the private equity side, that pressure has become more and more apparent as 2023 has progressed. And this is this trend is only going to continue into 2024. And even some people that I know are saying into 2025 as well. And so if you look at it purely from a limited partner perspective, this then trickles down into the GPs, into the fund managers, which then trickles down into their allocations into startups, lower middle market, middle market companies. So the whole dynamic is is completely shifted from where we were two years ago. Right, absolutely. And this significantly impacts how uh, VCs and GPs operate as well, because since it, it's the ecosystem is changing on the back end, the money is not flowing as it used to. So, and there is also like NLPs need to see the returns from, from the VC funds, right? Uh, so are VCs feeling that kind of urgency in trying to show those res- results to their LPs? And how has that impacted uh, their approach to investing? So if you look at it, the, the, the thesis, um, let's say 2021, or even, even prior to that, the thesis for, for venture capital funds was that, okay, cash burn was not important. There was an understanding that you could burn cash for, a startup could burn cash for three to four years without it really becoming a problem in terms of reporting a return to the limited partners. That There was this fundamental understanding that, hey, we have to take this risk it's going to pay off down the road, uh, whether it was through an acquisition or through an IPO. And what has shifted now is that there is a push now by VC funds to startups to start showing results. And and that point of of getting to to cash flow, a cash flow positive balance sheet, that point has become more and more stressed during the due diligence process in that startups who prior to 2022 were able to project three to four years down the road and say that that they will become cash flow positive in 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 that time frame now there's a push for what can you do over the next 18 months what can you do over the next 24 months now this varies by sector prashant i i i think that's a, a really important point to stress so when you start talking about healthcare, when you start talking about AI in particular, there is there's much more patience um, with the LPs that trickles down into the VCs. But if you start looking at at other other asset classes within the startup ecosystem and industry sectors, there's a lot more pressure that is that is being passed along to those companies. And in my opinion, rightfully so. I think I think what what we had was a 10 year run of low interest rates, which has allowed a lot of these LPs to invest into VCs in a very patient uh, uh, investment thesis. And now that pressure has totally changed. So now it's all about profitability and when can you break even? Absolutely. That's very interesting. And this kind of shows the chain reaction that we have in venture capital industry and how it impacts from the, very beginning from LPs to the very end, the founders and how startups are being operated and being built. Uh, and this actually is significantly different, different from the environment we had, like you said, uh, for the past 10 years or so. And uh, startups were allowed to bleed capital, burn, and then grow at a rapid pace. And as a result of which, we had some behemoths as well. Some great companies were built as well which got tremendous scale uh, by taking that approach. And VC has been thought of as that asset class, which promises you those kinds of returns, that 10x return, right? So do you think that this new constraint of uh, profitability will impact, uh, you know, and slow down things for these startups that now they are more focusing on sustainability and trying to get profitable and maybe are not able to grow at that fast rate because of maybe lack of that kind of funding that they want to do that uh, or the need for profitability and need of VCs to see those uh, numbers in terms of profitability and sustainability? Well, it changes the business model. It changes the business model from the perspective of, okay, we can create a 
company that is going to that is going to create scale but the the scale now i'd say is much more planned and deliberate and i would say probably a little bit slower and more conservative than what has been projected by startups in the past and so i think that this more conservative approach probably counteracts the wishes and uh demands of startups and vc funds over the past 10 years which was actually that that thesis of hey we're going to invest into growth we're we don't care really when that growth may happen it could be five to seven years down the road but that business model we're less concerned about the business model producing results now. And, and what's happening now is the total opposite, is that there is a, a, a stronger focus on profitability, which could, your, to your point, it could impact the startup and what they're trying to develop. I'd say in particular in the AI sector, which takes time and a tremendous amount of resources in order to, um, in order to, to release a product. But at the same time, I see with, with other startups, I actually think that this is a very good thing because now you have to create a fundamentally sustainable business. And to be honest, for over the past 10 years, there wasn't a demand for that. Absolutely, totally agree. And I would like you to compare the two ecosystems or two different environments we, we are discussing here. The one we had maybe two, two, two to three years back when funding was flowing freely and to what we have now. Uh, and what impact has it had on valuations of companies? And do you think what we had then was more realistic or or makes more sense? Or what we have now is what should be the norm? Uh, or do you think we are in a cyclic kind of a motion where we'll be back to where we were and then maybe back to where we are now? So it just keeps moving. What's your view on that? If I had the right answer to that, I think I'd I'd be very wealthy right now because <laughs> I think everybody is trying to figure out what is a more normalized valuation and nobody seems to really have the answer because you can make two arguments here, right? I, I think everyone agrees that, that 2021, early 2022 valuations were, were, were overvalued. Uh, there seems to be a lot of consensus around that thesis, but if you look at now that there's there's a tremendous discount. And I'd say in particular for later stage companies, you haven't seen as much movie movement on early stage companies. So let's say pre-seed, seed, but getting into, into series B or higher, there has been a lot of pushback on valuation and you're starting to see significantly discounted valuations. So I think that the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, I think that we're probably... In some cases now, there might be Series A companies or Series B companies that are overly discounted. Um, part of that could just be the need for cash, that, that these companies are running out of cash. They've been burning a lot of cash. But do I think it is, you know, do we need to go back to where we were in, in 2021, 2019? And the answer is, is no. I think, I think the answer is, is somewhere in the middle. And private equity for years has actually been more attuned to valuing companies in this approach because you have to look at historical financials and and uh, trailing three years on, on a certain company in order to appropriately value it. And I think VC can actually learn a lot from the private equity approach now in terms of what is a normal valuation. Absolutely, totally agree. Uh, and another aspect uh, of this episode that I wanted to cover with you is is about the LATAM aspect and how it, it is working with the US ecosystem as well. And you yourself uh, run a LATAM based company uh, called Apertura, which is a service based company, I guess. Uh, so I uh, would love to know how's the startup ecosystem shaping up in LATAM and uh, how are the startups there working with the US companies? And also how it's a hub for outsourcing a lot of a lot of uh, processes and things uh, for the U.S. startups and companies. So just to provide a little bit more 
context for your listeners. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm an advisor, but I'm also have been developing my own portfolio of, of, of companies, in particular in the technology or technical outsourcing space, which I think is such an interesting um, uh, such an interesting industry sector to be in now because of labor issues in the United States, Europe, and Canada. And so I've I've been I've been an advisor um, in the Latin American market for over ten years, and and work with a lot of LPs companies in the region as well. The what's happened with the startup ecosystem in the Latin American market was really tremendous growth from about twenty fifteen on. Um, what you saw was a more U.S. VCs uh, going into the region. Some of them were taking advantage of, let's say, uh, in LP uh, funding that is allocated for emerging markets, whether it's through the, the, the World Bank or, or other instruments like that. So it's cheap capital that can be deployed in emerging markets. And it allowed them to sort of dip their toes into the water, sort of test it out, see what opportunities there existed, because the Latin American market is 25 years behind where the U.S. has been in terms of startup development, VC development. Now, the Latin American market, you have to think of it as a lot of different countries and a lot of that, that may be further along in the cycle, like, I, for example, Mexico, Brazil. Chile in particular, are much further along than countries like Colombia or Peru. And so what's happening is that there has been a, a big push towards catching up to uh, more of a developing more of a startup ecosystem in these countries. And so there has been an increase in capital. Now, what's happened, though, since the, the pandemic is that a lot of that funding has started to slow down. So what was a a trend that was happening in 2018, 2019, and early 2020 has started to slow over the past couple of years. And that's more of a global slowdown in VC capital than anything else. But that, that's sort of what's been happening. But, but to answer your second question, what's really interesting is the ability to solve problems that companies and funds in the U.S. Are, are, are seeing in the Latin American market. So what's grown there is, is things like outsourcing. You're starting to even see startups in the United States dipping into the Latin American market to help solve some of their labor issues. Uh, could be around data analysis, IT development. Um, we've seen it also, cybersecurity um, is, is growing as well, engineering. And there has been a push into the Latin American market in order to do that. And so it's, it's a trend that just keeps growing all the way up to, to middle market companies who are now doing things like moving their supply chain in the Latin American market because of supply chain stress coming out of Asia. So it's, it's become a very dynamic place to do business, but it's still very early. We're still, they're still learning how to conduct business, let's say cross-border into the United States and the investors now have sort of tightened their um, mandates in the region because of just broader economic conditions. Right. Absolutely. I totally agree. And that that's, uh, and I'm, I'm bullish on the Latin aspect of being, being an outsourcing hub for the use as well, that, that it in itself is, is a big uh, business opportunity one because of its proximity to the U S more or less the same time zones and also, you know, population more or less understands the language of the U.S. as well. So, which which countries in particular do you think have the highest quality in terms of a talent uh, that can be maybe of is more cost effective, but is more or less the same quality that maybe you'd find find in the U.S. Prashant, to your point, and I think you 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 brought up a, a really interesting um, detail: the cultural alignment is very interesting between the United States and, and, and Latin America. And part of it is, is based on a, a few factors. The first is there are a lot of Latin descent people who live in the United States. So there's already a connection to that region. Uh, but then also, I, I think locally, 
and I, I manage manage operations throughout the region, is that when you when you're there, there is an I think a more of an appreciation or understanding of the U.S. culture in some of these places. But to give you specifics, I'd say Mexico is always impressive, uh, and I think that is due to the proximity to the United States. Um, also, the fact that you have had a lot of multinational companies that operate in, in places like Mexico City, uh, Guadalajara, Monterrey, and that has created tremendous outsourcing opportunities from those hubs into the U.S. because of bilingual talent, technical talent, um, highly trained, highly skilled uh, talent that is then exported into, into the US. And, and there is that cultural fit that we talked about before. I also view um, countries like Colombia, where we do have a sizable operation for Apertura as, as being a sort of a hidden gem in that, well, people are catching up to this, so it's maybe it's not all that hidden anymore, <laughs> but there is a, there is a, um, a strong ta uh, technical talent uh, population in some of the urban centers like Bogota, Medellin, Barranquilla, Cali, that provide uh, some of the skills that are needed, um, in particular in markets like the United States. I'd say on the IT side, call centers, back office. You know, we take we take financial analysts and we export them to the United States virtually because there is the technical talent uh, there that sometimes needs to be trained but at the same time can easily be, de be deployed into the U.S. Um, other markets, to give you a few other examples, Argentina is always interesting, I'd say because of the education system in Argentina. It's a little bit harder to conduct a business there, though. And that challenge of local currency, lining a local currency up to a dollar-based uh, uh, salary is, is a little more tricky. And then the other one, which I'm, I'm highly active in, is the Brazilian market. Um, while there is less of a bilingual Portuguese English population, there is a strong technical, um, technical, ed technically educated uh, population that can easily de be deployed into the U.S., Europe, and Canada for companies that are looking for support. So all in all, I'm very bullish on the outsourcing in Latin America. But that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I'm very, very bullish on where, how things are shaping up for Latin America. And uh, in due time, I think the startup ecosystem there itself is going to be something to watch out for, right? Uh, and now, now let's talk about uh, the M&A side of things because you're in, involved with both the buy side and this sell side uh, of things so uh, can you give us a perspective a perspective of how things are looking right now uh, on both sides of the table what happened was that there was a there was a pause in MA activity from the end of last year into the let's call it the middle of this year where if you were to look at it statistically transactions have been way down um, Part of this has been driven by the fact that it's now harder to finance acquisitions. So if you're a buyer who's looking for debt to leverage a transaction, it's, it's becoming more difficult in order to find that debt. And also layered in on top of that, broader concerns around the U.S. economy, emerging market economies, uh, Europe as well, add in a war between Russia and Ukraine. And so there, there was much more of a hesitation around deals. I also think, too, valuations, and in particular in PE, have had yet to be normalized um, or discounted a bit based on these conditions. But what we've seen over the past quarter or two is that we've seen a slight pickup um, in acquisitions. And I think that trend is going to continue um, through the balance of this year. I, I also believe, though, that January and February is going to be a bit slow, but it will pick up again getting into Q2 of next year. And I think on the technology side, startup side, you're starting to see a lot more movement. And this goes back to what we were talking about before. 
companies that had raised rounds in 2020, 2021, are now in a position where they've burned their cash or are burning their cash, and they don't really have a backup plan because it's harder for them to raise capital. Uh, maybe they were looking at a strategic acquisition that didn't pan out. And so what's happening is that I've, I'm now starting to see buyers that are coming in to acquire those those companies at tremendous discounts. So you look at a Series A company, to give you an example, in 2021 had valued themselves at $25 million. About two months ago, I was working with a family office that was going to acquire its assets for less than a million. And so this is this trend, in my opinion, is only going to continue as these companies start to run out of cash. Absolutely. And uh, I also sense an uptick in, in the secondary markets. Uh, so w- what's the kind of activity you're seeing there? Great point. So there's been a huge increase in secondary transactions uh, that is... I think just based on the way that these financial instruments are structured, it it allows a secondary investor to come in and a, and acquire that position at a discount at a significant discount. So I've actually seen LPs that have invested into these funds. I have a a, a friend in California who is finalizing their uh, about to close their a four hundred million dollar secondary fund. And this was through a couple of LPs who are just sensing this opportunity in the marketplace and the need for these types of instruments. So it's, it is, you're absolutely right. This is something that's only going to increase. The, the other one that I, I think is really asset class that's really interesting right now is private credit. And if you look at, at private credit institutions and firms, they're now competitive with a normal bank because of interest rates. And so that allows them to deploy capital into a broad range of asset classes um, that maybe weren't as competitive before. And, and that has actually trickled down into the startup space as well. So you're starting to see more firms creating instruments for specifically for startups to help give them the cash that they need in order to keep scaling and developing their company. So secondaries, private credit, I'm, I'm very opportunistic on that because I see that there's there, the need for those instruments. Absolutely. That's very interesting to learn. Um, and uh, you're an Emotion Capital and you run an interesting set of companies there. So tell us more about what is Emotion Capital and uh, what are you trying to achieve there? So it's, thesis is very simple. It's a holding structure for my participation in a few different companies. Um, and everything, we've created an ecosystem there where companies sort of work together. Um, you, you see these structures, I'd say in particular with, with family offices, where resources are shared between different operational and, and investment assets. And that's what, that's what I've, I've started to do. Uh, the thesis has been in the past uh, mostly looking at the outsourcing segment. So Apertura being a great example of that. We talked about that before, taking technical talent from the Latin American market and deploying that in the United States, Canada, and Europe. And it's everything from financial analysis, commercial and industrial engineering to cybersecurity, uh, back office support. The other uh, holding that I have within that company is, is also... Um, it's specifically sourcing. So it's, it's product and supply chain because there has been a push, as I said before, from Asia into the Latin American market by U.S. companies who are looking to develop more near shore access to production products and goods. Uh, and then the other one, other asset in there is a, a healthcare outsourcing company, U.S. domestic called Informera. Informera is nurse case management outsourcing, and it's providing nurses for families, facilities, and deploying them into a more of like a consultation and advisory type of role, but then using technology in order to implement that as well. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll be making some announcements around there and and, and proprietary technology that we're building out with a partner called Montuno 
that is going to allow us to create more one-on-one -on -one nurse consulting virtually for patients who really need it. So that the thesis is very opportunistic within immersion capital. It's, it's more of, hey, what are myself and some of my partners looking for in an opportunity, but also what value add can we provide with existing resources that we have in the United States and in Latin America as well? Yeah, I love that. So it's basically a holding company structure, right? Yes, I, I've tossed around the idea in the past of creating a fund, but be mm -hmm. because of my advisory okay. work, and, and also the compliance right. end of things as well. I'd much rather be in a position that I can be opportunistic and frankly, don't have to answer to LPs as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Yeah, I lo love the holding company model as well. Uh, and we recently had uh, Michael Girdley. I'm not sure if you are aware of him, uh, but he's uh, pretty big on yeah. Twitter. And uh, and he preaches this model of, of uh, building a holding company. He has built like 12 businesses, uh, within his portfolio that he runs and uh, they're doing about a hundred, hundred million dollars, uh, annual recurring. Right. So that's, that's kind Incredible. of amazing, mind blowing stuff. So, uh, yeah. So that, that makes me curious about this model as well. Uh, and, and kudos to you trying to do, uh, the same, uh, focusing on Latin America and U S markets, uh, serving more yep. developed markets. Right. Uh, awesome. Awesome. That's right. It's, it's been great. Uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen, ha having you on the podcast and you sharing insights uh, across different, uh, you know, stakeholders of the venture capital ecosystem, all the way from LPs to VCs to founders, uh, and also an aspect of uh, how the LATAM market is starting to work with the more developed markets of US and Europe. Uh, so been a great episode and kudos to everything that you're doing. Uh, let us know how our listeners can get to you, maybe follow you or maybe write to you. Uh, whichever way is best to follow your journey ahead. Prashant, really appreciate you taking the time today. This has been a very interesting conversation. For those who are interested in following, please go to immersioncapital.com. You can also find us at opertura.co. And you can see on our website that links to other uh, our, all of our other companies as well. But really appreciate you taking the time. And this has been a, a great conversation. Absolutely. Likewise. Thanks so much. Thanks, Prashant.